sisters, each of us called to walk in your light. Gather your people, O oh Lord, O oh Lord. Gather your people, O oh Lord. One bread, one body, one spirit. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And with your spirit. My friends, we come here today to celebrate this third Sunday of Lent. We continue this Lenten journey, seeking always more to be like Jesus, to open our hearts, as the woman of Samaria did at the well, to both hear his word, to understand him, to receive him, and to constantly grow in faith, acknowledge him as our Lord and our Savior. And so, my brothers and sisters, let us acknowledge our sins and so prepare ourselves to celebrate the sacred mysteries. Almighty God, have mercy on us, forgive us our sins, and bring us to everlasting life. Amen. Amen. Let us pray. <coughs> o God, author of every mercy and of all goodness, who in fasting, prayer, and almsgiving have shown us a remedy for sin, look graciously on this confession of our lowliness, that we who are bowed down by our conscience may always be lifted up by your mercy. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. A reading from the book of Exodus. In those days, in their thirst for water, the people grumbled against Moses, saying, Why did you ever make us leave Egypt? Was it just to have us die here of thirst with our children and our livestock? So Moses cried out to the Lord, What shall I do with this people? A little more, and they will stone me. The Lord answered Moses, Go over there in front of the people, along with some of the elders of Israel, holding in your hand as you go the staff with which you struck the river. I will be standing there in front of you on the rock in Horeb. Strike the rock and the water will flow from it for the people to drink. This Moses did in the presence of the elders of Israel. The place was called Massa and Meribah because the Israelites quarreled there and tested the Lord saying, is the Lord in our midst or not? 
The word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. reading from the letter of St. Paul to the Romans. Brothers and sisters, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith to this grace in which we stand, and we boast in hope of the glory of God. And hope does not disappoint, because the love of God has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. For Christ, while we were still helpless, died at the appointed time for the ungodly. Indeed, only with difficulty does one die for a just person, though perhaps for a good person one might even find courage to die. But God proves his love for us 
and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. The word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. to you. According to John, Glory to you. Jesus came to town of Samaria called Sychar, near the plot of land that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there. Jesus, tired from the journey, sat down there at the well. It was about noon. A woman of Samaria came to draw water. Jesus said to her, give me a drink. His disciple had gone into the town to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, how can you, a Jew, ask me, a Samaritan woman, for, for a drink? Jesus answered and said to her, if you knew the gift of God, and who is saying to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you a living water. The woman said to him, Sir, you do not even have a bucket, and the cistern is deep. Where then can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob? who gave us this cistern and drink from his, himself with his children and in his flocks. Jesus answered and said to her, Everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water I shall give will never <coughs> thirst. The water I shall give will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I may not be thirsty or have to keep coming here to draw water. I can see that you are the prophet. Our ancestors worshipped on this mountain, but you people say that the place to worship in, in Jerusalem Jesus said to her, Believe in me, and believe me, woman, the hour is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You people worship what you do not understand. We worship what we understand because salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming and is now here. When true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. And indeed, Father seeks such people to worship Him. God is spirit, and those who worship Him must worship in spirit and truth. The woman said to Him, I know that the Messiah is coming, the one called the Christ. When he comes, he will tell us everything. 
Jesus, Jesus said to her, I am he, the one who is speaking with you. Many of the Samaritans of that town began to believe in him. When the Samaritan came to him, they invited him to stay with them, and he stayed there two days. Many more, <coughs> Sorry. Many more began to believe in him because of his word. And they said to the woman, We no longer believe because of your word. For we have heard our, ourselves, and we know that this is truly the Savior of the world. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. You've gotten to know me a little bit as I've celebrated Mass here a couple times. But one thing you may not know is when I was a little fellow, I was very stubborn. I was actually quite spoiled. And to be perfectly frank, this is not any attack on my mom. She did an incredible job raising me. It was really my character, my personality, that because of being stubborn and wanting my way and how I want it, very often I was spoiled. And I recall one time when I was four years old, my brother, my sister, my mom, who at that time would have been about a couple of months pregnant with my sister Kara, that, and also my Aunt Mary and Uncle Pete, we went to this place called Dooley Park. Dooley Park was an elementary, it was near Dooley Elementary in Roseville. And it was a hot summer day. And of course, my brother and I having a great time on the twirly slide, swinging, wonderful time. And it got maybe 30 minutes or so into this, and well, I'm thirsty, I need a drink. And I went up to my mom, mom, I'm thirsty. And she said, James, I'm sorry, I forgot the drinks at, at the house. Well, mom, I'm thirsty, I want a drink right now. And not understanding science or biology, I started to whine and complain, and waste precious breath and spit. And I complained, I whined, I wanted a drink, didn't matter. Give me a drink right now. That me and my brother went and stood by the basketball nets, looking up at the great street light, wishing I could push a button and water would come flowing out of that street light. Nope. No help for little Jimmy there. And then my uncle, seeing the situation, says, well, let's go and let's get something to drink. And he took us to 7-Eleven. And you may know, you who are parents, that if what will satiate thirst, water or a Slurpee? Well, water, probably. And my mom said, well, James, just we'll get you some water there. No. I want a Slurpee. Well, you're thirsty, that's not good for you right now. I want a Slurpee, I don't care. I'm thirsty. And I got my Slurpee, and it felt good, but I was still thirsty after that. And certainly my mom knew. She knew what I needed. She knew what would have been good for me. But as that little boy, as that stubborn little guy, I wanted a drink and I didn't care. Whatever I want, I'm gonna get. Now, in this glorious, beautiful month of March, I just turned 33 years old, and I've gotten a little better. But the Holbeck family, we come from Belgium, that traditionally they're described as kind of hardy folk, a little stubborn, likened to a particular animal that roams the plains. And that element of stubbornness, that what I want, what I desire, even as a grown man, as a priest, can still sometimes guide my thoughts, my words, my actions. But that element of thirst, that powerful experience of being thirsty, how it can be changed to a desiring or yearning for God. This de desiring, this thirsting that can be for any Christian, for anyone who has faith, anyone who desires to know their Savior. And in such a beautiful, powerful way, the Lord using this human experience, this discomfort, this struggle of being thirsty, to lead to both an encounter with him and an understanding of who he is and what he's able to offer those who thirst. That we know this, this gospel parable very well. We hear it, or at least the form of it, throughout Lent. And that we come to this encounter of Jesus passing through Samaria. That we know in his original mission that he was sent to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. That very often he didn't have much interaction with Gentiles or the Samaritans. 
But in this particular occasion, as he's going back, he's going back to Israel to preach, to teach, he passes through this town of Samaria. That his disciples, who are normally with him, are given a task to go buy food, to go elsewhere, and there he is alone. And our Lord Jesus, though true God, is true man, wearied, tired, thirsty from his work, goes and sits by a well, a well that was known, Jacob's well. And one of the incredible things of this, this scripture, and I read this in a commentary, is that there's so many incredible allusions to the Old Testament that at a well, Jacob met his wife, or other Old Testament figures met their wives or prospective wives at a well, this encounter, this experience of love. And all of a sudden, a woman who was not lovable, a woman who probably was outcast, given her testimony a few lines later, a woman comes in the dead heat of the day to draw water. And there, collapsed in front of her, is our Savior, this blessed Lord of ours. And he says something to her which would have shocked her, maybe offended her. Give me a drink. In other words, I thirst. That you know as well as I do that in John chapter 19, as he's on the cross, he says the same thing. And of course, on the one hand, yeah, he is tired, he is human, he's got some, some needs of, of, of fulfilling and quenching that thirst. But it's a test. The woman, at first, doesn't pass it. She identifies who he is, you a Jew, why are you asking me, a Samaritan, for anything? let alone to drink from the same thing that I'm going to drink. And to a certain extent, what business is it of hers? He's asking her. And so then he says to her, in a sense, elevating her, lifting her out of that ignorance, that uncertainty. If you knew the gift of living water, if you knew who I was, you would give me a drink. Now again, practically, well, you have no bucket. How can you draw anything? And then, of course, going a little, a little deeper, because Jesus refers to something. He refers to this living water, which on the one hand would point to something like a running stream or a spring, fresh water, as opposed to well water, which can be stagnant, which can be not necessarily pleasing to the taste. But in saying this, he's referring to something deeper. And the woman picks up on that, because she says... Are you saying that you're greater than our father Jacob, who gave us this well, one of the patriarchs, that you have something greater to offer? And if you notice, Jesus doesn't say, yeah, because he doesn't want to come off as arrogant or boastful. But he says, everyone who drinks this water, that is from the well, naturally will thirst again. It's well water. You're going to come back. You're going to have to. But whoever drinks the water that I will give will never thirst. The water I shall give will well up in him, and become a spring of, of water welling up to eternal life. That we know that what he's ultimately pointing to is both the gift of the Holy Spirit, who refreshes, gives life, grace, and is a powerful source of that relationship between God and human beings. But also, too, in giving this living water, it's a way of having a relationship with him. It's knowing him. It's having that faith in who he is. It's receiving everything that we need from our Savior. And so the incredible thing is that as this conversation goes on, as the Lord reveals more and more of who he is, as this woman, again, showing both intelligence, but even just a little bit of faith, more and more coming to a deeper understanding, that yes, Jesus shows his incredible knowledge, his wisdom, identifying that she has been married multiple times. This is part of the reason she's been outcast that she's considered not of, of good reputation. That, not, that unlike the people who could draw at the cool times of the day, she had to go where she wouldn't be attacked. But she draws water, and in this chance, she encounters salvation. Because after he shows his knowledge, after she identifies that he's a prophet, after her faith is stirred and understanding who she is, she says something incredible. I know that the Messiah is coming, the one called the Christ. When he comes, he will tell us everything. Going from this disputation, this argument, you a Jew asking me for water, 
you have nothing to draw from. That her faith is stirred, going from challenge to talking about doctrine. The Jews worship in Jerusalem, we worship at Mount Gerizim, who's right? To now showing that faith, that I believe the Savior is coming. In a sense, how will I recognize when he comes? You who have such great knowledge, you who are a great prophet, you who are greater than Jacob, how will I know? And he says, I am he, the one who is speaking with you. He identifies who he is. I am the Christ. I am the promised one. That what I speak, the water that I want to give you is my love, my grace, my mercy, and to save you from not just your sin, but from that darkness, that the light that I offer through my truth, the salvation that I alone can give, I'm the one. And so, of course, her response is to go to draw others to Christ. She immediately leaves her bucket. She goes, gets the other townsfolk. They come running. That our Lord, desiring to just pass through, spends two days with them. Because, again, it's not just the that, that he thirsts for the faith of this woman, but for all peoples. That these Samaritans who represent, in a sense, foreigners, aliens, not those who are part of the people of Israel, eventually foreshadow the church who will go out to all nations, who will bring knowledge of the Savior to all peoples, that will invite people to have that personal relationship with him, but also being part of his church. But what does Jesus thirst for? That some have said, you know, he thirsts for you. He thirsts for your love. He thirsts for your faith. And all of that is true. All of that, if you will, is what we can offer him through our prayers, through our love for him, the simple acts of charity we do for our neighbor, seeking him out in everybody. But he says, I thirst. I desire you. I yearn for you, my child. But do you thirst for me? Do you yearn for me? That as we go through this Lent, we know that a big part of our, our process or in the progress we make is identifying those areas of sin. That of course, in recognizing the, the image of the well, which is stagnant water, sometimes this gets foul, makes you thirsty again. What a fitting and apt image for sin, things that don't satisfy things that make us fall back into sin again and again. The people who struggle with lust, that it's a powerful temptation, it's a powerful thing you fall into. But every time you fall, you yearn for more and you fall further away from the Savior. That well that leads to death. Is that what we thirst for? Do we thirst for the things of this world that may feel good, that may give us a little bit of a break, but cannot satisfy or save? My friends, do we thirst for Jesus? Do we thirst for his grace, his mercy, his truth? That in imitation of this woman, that we recognize in coming to Christ, she has a problem. She's been married multiple times. She has a person with him who's not her spouse. Jesus identifies that. But she doesn't run away. She could have. As soon as Jesus showed that knowledge, in fear or in shame, she could have ran and hid again, but she stayed. She stayed and, got, and came to know him, to believe in him, and that her life changed. And knowing his word and acting on it, she led others to him. And so today, as we hear this word of God, as we reflect on this beautiful gospel, on the one hand, if there's any sin, if there's any darkness, if there's any part of us that yearns for that well of darkness, sin or anything that is not of God. Like the woman, let us come to Christ. Let us not fear or shirk of his mercy, that he's willing to forgive and pardon. If, like little Jimmy, there's that stubbornness, what I want, how I'm going to get it, doesn't matter. This is not the type of water or relationship that will save, because it's all about me. It's all about what I want and how I'm going to get it. But rather, an imitation of our Savior too. He who thirsts for us, he who desires us to know him, to love him, to hope in him. Can we say the same? Jesus, I thirst for you. Jesus, I desire you.
Can we say with Psalm 42, like the, the deer that yearns for running streams, so my soul yearns for my God. My soul is thirsting for the living God. May that answer to that question be yes. That as we continue this journey through Lent, may our desire for God, may our yearning for salvation in heaven, and may our desire to turn away from sin to the grace and gospel that our Lord gives, may it guide us to him. May it open our hearts to receive that love that he wants to share. But may it also give us the grace and strength to turn and offer him our love, to help quench his thirst, and allow him to love us, for he yearns for us, he desires us, because we belong to him. And though we are not worthy because we do sin, we also have that beauty of being beloved children of our God. And so, thirst for him. Turn away from things of death, things that don't satisfy, don't save. But open your heart to that God who desires you and loves you, but wants to be loved and desired all the same. And so rising, uniting ourselves to our brothers and sisters who will be entering into the church this year, let us pray now the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. And so we are confident in the mercy and love of our Heavenly Father. We give thanks to God that through our baptism we are his beloved children. And so filled with this confidence, let us now offer these, our prayers and our petitions. For the needs of the Universal Church, St. Patrick Parish, and in particular for all the parishioners of St. Patrick Parish. For all the church, may Christ, who is the source of living water, continue to quench our thirst for righteousness. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. <clears throat> for our national and local leaders, may the Holy Spirit foster in them a thirst for peace and justice, especially for the weak and vulnerable among us. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. <clears throat> For all who struggle with sin and guilt or whose hearts are hardened by the challenges of life, may they experience the forgiving love of Christ. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For all in our local community who have yet to encounter Christ, may the truth, beauty, and goodness of our faith enliven their spirits and lead them to the Lord. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For all those who have died, may they come to share in the fullness of life with the risen Christ. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For the homebound viewing this Mass, that all of their prayers will be answered. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. Almighty and merciful Father, we thank you for the many gifts you give us. Give us the grace and strength we need to know your Son and to offer our lives as sacrifice to him, loving him and seeking his truth always. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen.
Our preparation song is number 614, Amazing Grace, number 614. brothers and sisters, that my sacrifice and yours may be acceptable to God, the Almighty Father. Be pleased, O Lord, with these sacrificial offerings, and grant that we who beseech pardon for our sins may take care to forgive our neighbor through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and just. It is truly right and just, our duty and our salvation, always and everywhere to give you thanks, Lord, Holy Father, Almighty and Eternal God, through Christ our Lord. For when he asked the Samaritan woman for water to drink, he had already created the gift of faith within her. And so ardently did he thirst for her faith that he kindled in her the fire of divine love. And so, we too give you thanks, and with the angels praise your mighty deeds as we acclaim. Holy, O Lord, and all you have created rightly gives you praise. For through your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, by the power and working of the Holy Spirit, you give life to all things and make them holy. 
and you never cease to gather a people to yourself, so that from the rising of the sun to its setting, a pure sacrifice may be offered to your name. Therefore, O Lord, we humbly implore you, by the same Spirit, graciously make holy these gifts we have brought to you for consecration, that they may become the body and blood of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, at whose command we celebrate these mysteries. For on the night he was betrayed, he himself took bread, and giving you thanks, he said the blessing, broke the bread, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and eat of it, for this is my body, which will be given up for you. In a similar way, when supper was ended, he took the chalice, and giving you thanks, he said the blessing, and gave the chalice to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and drink from it, for this is the chalice of my blood, the blood of the new and eternal covenant, which will be poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in memory of me. The mystery of faith. Therefore, O Lord, as we celebrate the memorial of the saving passion of your Son, his wondrous resurrection and ascension into heaven, and as we look forward to his second coming, we offer you in thanksgiving this holy and living sacrifice. Look, we pray, upon the oblation of your church, and recognizing the sacrificial victim by whose death you willed to reconcile us to yourself, grant that we who are nourished by the body and blood of your Son and filled with his Holy Spirit may become one body, one spirit in Christ. May he make of us an eternal offering to you, so that we may obtain an inheritance with your elect, especially with the most blessed Virgin Mary, Mother of God, with blessed Joseph, her spouse, with your blessed apostles and glorious martyrs, with St. Patrick, and with all the saints on whose constant intercession in your presence we rely for unfailing help. May the sacrifice of our reconciliation, we pray, O Lord, advance the peace and salvation of all the world. Be pleased to confirm in faith and charity your pilgrim church on earth, with your servant Francis our Pope and Alan Vigneron our Bishop, the order of bishops, all the clergy, and the entire people you have gained for your own. Listen graciously to the prayers of this family whom you have summoned here before you. In your compassion, O merciful Father, gather to yourself all your children scattered throughout the world. To our departed brothers and sisters, and to all who are pleasing to you at their passing from this life, give kind admittance to your kingdom. There we hope to enjoy forever the fullness of your glory, through Christ our Lord, through whom you bestow on the world all that is good. Through him and with him and in him, O God, Almighty Father, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours forever and ever. At the Savior's command, informed by divine teaching, we dare to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. 
Deliver us, Lord, we pray, from every evil. Graciously grant peace in our days that, by the help of your mercy, we may be always free from sin and safe from all distress, as we await the blessed hope and the coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Lord Jesus Christ, who said to your apostles, Peace I leave you, my peace I give you. Look not on our sins, but on the faith of your church, and graciously grant her peace and unity in accordance with your will, who live and reign forever and ever. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. And with your spirit. Let us all point to the sign of peace. sins of the world, blessed are those called to the supper of the Lamb. Lord, I am not worthy that he should enter into my roof, but only say the word and my soul shall be healed. May the body of Christ keep me safe for eternal life. Let us pray. 
As we receive the pledge of things yet hidden in heaven and are nourished while still on earth with the bread that comes from on high, we humbly entreat you, O Lord, that what is being brought about in us in mystery may come to true completion through Christ our Lord. Amen. And so before the final blessing that even though we have this season of Lent, which is a beautiful time of purification, we know that coming up here soon will be uh, the, the feast day for this parish, St. Patrick's. And for the parishioners here, I hope it is very blessed. I hope it's a wonderful day of, of prayer and praising God and certainly St. Joseph's on the 19th. And so may the prayers of St. Joseph, the prayers of St. Patrick always guide us more to know Jesus, to love him. And as I go back to Holy Family, know my prayers for you, the parishioners here at St. Patrick's, and for those at home, and keep us all in, in line with Christ as we seek to be his disciples. The Lord be with you. And, and with your spirit. spirit. May Almighty God bless you, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let Abraham then go in peace, glorifying the Lord by your life. Thanks be to God. Our song for sending forth is number 278, Somebody's Knocking at Your Door, number 278. Somebody's knocking at your door, somebody's knocking at your door. Somebody's knocking at your door. Oh, sinner, why don't you answer? Somebody's knocking at your door. Can't you hear him? Somebody's knocking at your door. Can't you hear him? Somebody's knocking at your door. Somebody's knocking at your door. Jesus calls you. Somebody's knocking at your door. Jesus calls you. Somebody's knocking at your door.